All right. I can have all your attention, please. Um, let me remind you of some of your theater etiquette before we get started. Obviously, you don't have a phone making noise. Hopefully. Uh, no hats are put on. Please. So if you have a hat or if you have a hood up, please take care of that. All right. You don't close to the theater, but you have a bad hair day out. I will let the slide this time. That seems to be the easy that I got. You know, you have to wait to get off and see if it's a bad day. You got to be real with it. You're not shit. Okay. The other thing is, is um, this is basically a semi-casual recital. That's why the people are not dressed up a lot. <laughs> but it's still, but it's not a... It's not a, uh, it's not so informal that we yell out the best friend and all that, correct? Let me first start by introducing to you a, um, Free time. Yeah, I, I was distracted by somebody messing with somebody's hair. Thank you. I know. Okay, so, uh, this is a, we have a retired vocal music teacher from any of you that went to Car Lane. If you would have been there oh, years ago, that would have that would have, she would have been your vocal music teacher. Uh, very lovely lady. After she retired from Car Lane, she uh, she I know she was doing this probably before you, but but it seemed like she really dedicated so much more time to this cause. She is the artistic director of the Scottish Park Mission here in St. Louis. So I'm going to introduce her. think of traditions as dead things. People think of blues, for instance, or jazz, as though they're somehow based slightly in the past. They're not. These are traditions that are still ongoing. Uh, Scottish music is another one of them. Celtic music generally, that is music that comes from the Celtic countries of Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Brittany in modern France, Galicia in modern Spain. Uh, these are Celtic countries where the, the, the group of languages that was spoken was not English, was much older. And we still have the Gaelic language in Scotland, for instance, which is um, spoken by around, at the moment, I think around about 150,000 people up there in the northwest of the country. And that is the root, the original root of this music. But it has become much more than that. It has become something that belongs to everybody now in Scotland. And because of the fact that we now play it everywhere, it belongs to my friends behind me here because they have taken the responsibility, which I will show you when they play with me breaking the silence with this kind of music. So here we go, I'm going to play you a few different things and try and explain things as I go along. I'm going to start with a set of tunes on the fiddle, 
And before anybody asks, there is no difference between a fiddle and a violin, you just call it a fiddle. Okay? Uh, the first tune, I don't know how many of you go to church, but if you do, um, the first tune is a tune that you may have heard when a baby is being christened. It's very often played in church. It's called By Cool Siloam's Shady Will. And um, that shows you something that happens a lot in Scotland and in Ireland with music. Uh, this tune is probably centuries old, and we don't know who wrote it, but then suddenly the clergyman uh, came along and said, oh, that would make a really nice hymn tune. And he basically stole it. He put his name on it and said, that, I wrote that. And uh, he didn't write it. No. It's a very, very old tune. It comes from a tradition uh, in the borders between Scotland and England, where the valleys, mainly, mainly sheep uh, uh, country there, and the valleys are quite lonely. The tunes that grew up there tended only to have one phrase. After that, I'm going to play a tune called The Burning of the Piper's Hut. Burning of the Piper's Hut is to do with genocide uh, in Scotland, in the Highlands of Scotland. Everybody thinks of the Highlands as this wonderful tourist area. In fact, the Highlands is uh, it's the location of one of the greatest crimes against Gaelic-speaking people that ever happened uh, anywhere in Europe. Around right about 1850, the people who owned the land, the clan chiefs, they decided, they discovered that they could make six times as much money from their land by having sheep on the land as having people on the land. So they simply told the people to go. They didn't care where they went. And when they wouldn't go, very often what they did was they burned their houses, so they had to go. Which is one of the reasons why you have so many Scottish people over here, because most of them came to America. Some of them went to Australia, some of them went to South Africa, but America was the main place of America and modern Canada. So the burning of the Piper's Hut commemorates that, it's a bit of sad tune. Then, after that, we play a tune about a mythical giant uh, called Long Johnny Muir. Long Johnny Muir uh, was about 15 feet tall and uh, wasn't particularly intelligent, but the only thing he could always do was beat the English. Okay? And because he couldn't beat the English, he was a national hero, even though he never existed. So, um, I play that quite slowly, and then I play it a little faster. And then after that, I don't really know what's going to happen. I'm probably going to play a faster tune again. It's a shame it's going to be. Uh, and can I just point out one thing to you, right? Okay? When I'm playing or when I'm talking, there is no ban on smiling. Right? <laughs> if any of you want to smile, that's okay by me. You know, so uh, I'm a trained professional. If you if, if you want to smile, just let the big one loose. I'm a trained professional. I can handle it. <laughs> so here we go. Like this, I'm on the here.
this move to something different, something very different. This is known as an English concertina. Now this is a English, this one was actually built in England, but the, the term English doesn't refer to uh, where it was built. It refers to the fact that it makes the same note when you push it and you pull it. Right? So with some of them, they're called Anglo concertinas, they make a different note when you push them and they actually pull it. They're like, they're like blues ones. Um, these were invented by a man called Sir Charles Folkestone, and in fact, it's disputed now because he apparently stole it from someone else. But uh, the interesting thing about these things uh, is they were, they were invented almost as an accident. So Charles Speedstone is the man who discovered how to make steel pliable, how to make steel bendy. Right? In other words, he discovered the process whereby if you take cold steel and put it into, I'm uh, sorry, if you take hot steel and plunge it into cold water, becomes fire. So he discovered this and uh, he had heard some instruments from the Far East called shams, which are like a, a mouth organ that's made from reeds that we find in marshes. And he had, he had seen what these things did, uh, did. And he decided that you could make a better instrument by doing the same thing as the reeds in these uh, shang instruments uh, by, de by doing them from steel. So he invented this. It became wildly popular, and the reason it became wildly popular was because, first of all, you didn't have to tune it, you had fixed notes. And secondly, it became quite a popular instrument among ladies, because Victorian men were very, very old-fashioned. They didn't like to see, for instance, women playing violins, because uh, women's bodies would move too much for that, and that made it excite the chaps too much, so they, they couldn't do that. So this was a very sedate instrument that women could play the world. And it became very popular, for instance, in, on the island of Ireland, where that, that, that ethos, if you like, from the men was very strong. So many of the best concertina players were from Ireland. Now, I'm going to play you a couple of tunes. I used to play in a band called the Battlefield Band. The only reason it's called the Battlefield Band is that was the district of Glasgow where we began the band and we couldn't think of a better name. Right? So we were the Battlefield Band. Um, and I, I've been a professional musician for nearly 50 years now. Okay? When we started this band way back in 1969, uh, we didn't have any idea that we were going to be professional musicians. And it wasn't until 1975 that we went on the road. 1976 we went on the road and we went to Inverness up in the north of Scotland. And on the way back down from Inverness, I was driving the van on my own. And I was driving down uh, a very secluded uh, road in the west of Scotland, uh, trying to write a song in my head, thinking, what rhymes with the year, the year, the year, the year? And the engine fell out of my van. That's not an exaggeration, it fell out all over the road. And um, as I was sitting there, feeling very sorry for myself, until the breakdown guys came, Great young guys came, took one look at it, handed me a box of matches and drove away. <laughs> and um, I sat there, I was feeling very sorry for myself, as the light came up. And as the light came up, I was beside what we call a loch. A loch is a lake. Okay? And the same loch long, I saw this most beautiful bird walking along on the shoreline, getting its breakfast. And it was a heron. So, and I, I decided at that point that, uh, uh, that no matter what, no matter how, how hard it got, I was going to be so I sat there, and uh, the, the way that we mark these things in, in our kind of music is to write a tune for a song of it. So this is called The Heron. Now after that, I'm going to play you uh, a tune uh, from Ireland. It's called Carolyn's Draft. And well, Carolyn was a blind harper. Very often blind people were, uh, were, were given musical instruments to that because that was one of the few ways they could carry their living. And Carolyn was a genius. And, uh, he composed this. Uh, uh, he composed this tune uh, under very strange circumstances. I don't have time to go into all that. But then we'll see what happens after that. So anyway, a couple of tunes. Originally built for the Salvation Army. Right. It's called a concertina. C O N C E R T I N. And this one doesn't belong to me. This belongs to my wife, Jacqueline. She very kindly lets me play.
see for the dancers. What is, what is that? What is that rhythm? It doesn't matter what the style is. Rhythm is rhythm, and dance is dance. Right? And if there is a rhythm, and you can dance to it. I have one thing that I do have to tell you, you don't need to stay locked into any one kind of genre, you know? You don't need to only like what the music business tells you to like. Right. right? You have to absolutely make up your own mind. There are only two kinds of music on this planet. There's good music and there's bad music. And the only people who can decide what's good and what's bad are you guys and you guys. And me. <laughs> okay. Let me show you a very different class of instrument here. This is a mandocello. A mandocello. N-A-N-G-O-C-E-L-L-O. Mandocello. Cello just means, uh, in the same way as uh, a cello, a cello just means bigger. Isn't that great noise? Now this is open tune. This became one of the. This is a testament to the way that all of our traditional musics in Scotland and Ireland uh, became. If you like, they're very voracious. If they, if they hear something that they think so, might sound good, if the players hear something, uh, then they will they will bring it into that kind of music. Way back in the 1960s, uh, uh, an Irish musician called Johnny Moyna played in the band called Flamsteed went on a holiday to Greece. And in Greece he found all these guys playing bazookas. And he thought that would fit really well in the Irish music. So he bought half a dozen cheap bazookas and brought them home and gave them to his friends as Christmas presents. And when his friends got them, they all started playing them in, in bands. You know? So the result was people began to look for more of the kind of Mediterranean uh, instruments. This one, this particular model is based on one that comes from Italy. But you'll also find them in Turkey. We were in a Moroccan restaurant yesterday where somebody was playing uh, an instrument called the Oud, O U D H, which is also a Turkish lute, and a, a, a Moroccan Algerian instrument. So it has become part of Scottish and Irish music. And I'm going to play you two jigs, right? Because very often we use these kind of instruments to tell stories. Now, the first tune I'm going to play you is called the Hag and the Spinning Board. Hag is a very old woman, usually very ugly, and very often it's a way of calling someone a witch. Alright, so Hag is spinning wheel. So I would like to dedicate this to the Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May. Who's <laughs> a awful woman, who's doing our music a great job. Anyway, I'm going to play that, then after that, I'm going to play another tune, which I wrote which is called the Hook of Holland. The Hook of Holland is where you, where you get the ferry to go back to Britain or where you land if you come from Britain on a ferry ship. So here we go. Now in my band, the Battlefield Band, this was known as the tank because it could be loud. Right? But it can also be very soft. And I'm going to play it softly for you. Now at the end, the Hook of Holland, um, the, the end of the story about the Hook of Holland has me walking away from a railway station, and you can hear it in the
do it before we get to the main event is on my little tour of uh, Scottish and Irish music, if you like. Uh, much more Scottish than Irish, but occasionally it comes to me. Um, I'm going to play you uh, an instrument that uh, is not really traditional. It's I always wanted to play the cello. That would be cello. Uh, but the idea came to me too late to learn, because you've got to start very early when you want to learn an instrument, as all my friends behind me know. So, a friend of mine who builds instruments in England, a man called Paul Bridgewater, brought this to me one day and said, why don't you try and play this? See if this will do for a chill. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Thank 